let's look at the words of Jesus together. This is Matthew, if you're taking notes. Matthew 19, Jesus said this, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So right at the beginning, Jesus is taking us back to the book of Genesis, and he's showing us the first man, the first woman, and he's telling us some things about marriage, and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now we looked at this passage the very first week of this series, and I thought it was wise to bookend this series because today is the last one. And so we're going back to God's original design for marriage. And this is what he's saying to us. He's saying, at the beginning, before sin, before the fall, this is how it was supposed to be. He says, God takes two people and he bonds them. And and it's not saying that God takes two people like God came into your dating app and made sure that you chose the right person. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that when you come before God, there are certain moments in a human life where God promises to enter fully into no matter what. And when two people make a lifelong covenant of marriage together, he comes in and he does, it's like, he does the spiritual bonding between your two souls. Amen. And because he does it, It's strong. And because he does it, it's so strong that if you were to tear it apart, and no one should ever tear it apart, but if you were to tear it apart, it would be a a tearing. It would be painful. It would be destructive. And we've experienced that. So let no one tear these two souls apart. No one should break the covenant, especially not us. And so we quoted Huey Lewis in the news. Yes, it's true. I'm so happy to be stuck with you. Amen? We talk the miracle of God's golden handcuffs that he gives us in the covenant of marriage. Golden handcuffs that are meant to keep us facing ourselves. Facing our own issues, our own hangups, and not running away because we want to run away. And there's something about if we have to be stuck and if we have to face the things that we need to work on, we don't just run and take us with us to the next situation. God's got better things for us, amen? Amen. And marriage is is his tool in order to help us through that. But man, we've got some hurt marriages in this room today. We're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the things that hurt us. If you remember the conflict week, we talked about the foxes that come into the vineyard and hurt the love that we have. And it's real. The addictions, the child abuse, the in-laws, the finances, the debts, the careers, all the things that get in the way. And many of us come to church today in a place where we do feel hurt and we've got the mask on and we're wearing the mask as if everything's fine and everything's not fine and you don't have to raise your hand. I'm not gonna do that to you, but I'm just speaking that truth over the room today and you folks online as well. It's important. Linda and I, I've, I've talked about this multiple times before, we do this premarital class together. And one of the things that we always find is that each week, we don't just teach people the truth out of God's word, but we give them stories out of our own life. And often in those stories, almost all the time in those stories, you can see our own sins, our own personal failures, and the brokenness that we've brought to our own marriage and how we've tried to work through it together. But there's a lot of reality vulnerability in those stories. And you usually get to about week two or week three or week four and people are walking around the, uh, these other couples in our class and they got big smiles on their face. And we're like, what are you smiling for? And they said, because we feel so much better now that we've heard how broken you are. <laughs> Why? Because you're a pastor. And there's this little lie inside of us that if we really knew Jesus if we really knew God's word, all the brokenness would magically fall away. And we wouldn't have sin anymore. And we wouldn't hurt each other and need forgiveness anymore. But guess what? We need the gospel every single day in a marriage. 
And it's that intimidation that messes with us. And that's one of the lies of Satan today that we're going to look at. But before I get to those, I want to talk about the gospel because we need the gospel. We need the gospel in balance. So if you're, if you're willing to just take both hands and hold them flat, palms up, kind of on your lap there. And the gospel is always two-handed. Can I just tell you that? It is grace and it is truth. And there is grace for you on the one hand. The fact that Jesus is not surprised at your broken marriage today. He saw every single fight you were ever going to have before the dawn of time. Amen. He knew exactly the cruel words, words that you were going to say when you were going to go way too far and you were going to fall into the addiction, all the stuff. He saw everything that you were going to do and he died for all of it. Yeah, that's right. He died for the guilt of all of it. Wow. Every husband, every wife, every person in this room, he died for marriages. Yeah. And so you're forgiven and you get a clean slate. Hallelujah. And here's the truth. He did not die so that you could be lazy in love. He did not die so that you would give up. He did not give you grace and forgiveness in a clean slate so that you would say, well, I guess it doesn't matter. No. See, he's a truthful God and he speaks the truth to you, dies for you and says, now get up again and let's, let's do the way of Jesus again. The clean slate is an invitation to try the way of Jesus again Amen. in your marriage. So today, don't be intimidated at your failures today, mask or no. Don't be intimidated by your failure. Instead, receive the grace of God and get back up again and let's walk the way of Jesus together. As if this weren't complicated enough, we've got the enemy to consider. So there is an enemy to your souls, whether you believe in him or not, he's still there. He is a reality. Jesus called him by name, called him Satan. He is the enemy, he's the accuser of the brethren. And this is what Jesus says about him, John 8, 44. Satan was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So here's the thing. Satan hates you, hates God, hates you, hates your marriage, hates what your family might become, and he's come against you according to the scripture, according to Jesus' own words. And the way he comes against us is with lies. And so we're going to look at his lies today because his lies might seem like, what's the big deal about a lie? Well, you're going to see what the big deal is about a lie. Because the lie is the poison in the stew. Why is, why is everything so hard? Why is everything so heavy? You're trying to lift this marriage, this, this expectation of love with a, a 10 ton weight on your shoulders. And it's a lie. And Jesus wants to come in and he wants to bring the truth. John 8, 32, it's not on your screens. He says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free, free from the lies. So God's solution is identify the marriage lies that your culture, even your parents, all motivated by hell, have spoken into your relationship that's holding your relationship back. Of course, no one meant to, but they're still there, yes? We still inherited them. So let's find these lies. The very first lie, and I'm going to go through these pretty quick because the final one is one that I want to spend a lot of time on. The very first lie is that I can change him or her. Yeah, you were supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> For some of us, this right here is why your marriage frustration is at a 10 right now. And you're like, well, we said the I do's and I had this whole plan and I had a list of everything that... And I want to shape them and I want to hint and I want to control in all the different ways. And I buy him books and he won't read them. <laughs> and I tell my friends, you know, to hint and to try to control and guilt and all the stuff. We got all the stuff, don't we? And none of it works because it's all based on a lie that you can change a human heart. And you can't Amen. change a human heart. There's no possible way. Only God can change a human heart. You can't even change your heart. That's part of the gospel. 
is it takes Jesus to come in and change you. And only as you surrender to him will he invade the home of your heart. You have to open the door. So here's what you do. James 5, 16, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Your move is to pray. But God, they... Now you pray, you surrender, you give them to the Lord. And when you do, just like in Gethsemane, you'll say, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. In your time, in your way. And oh, by the way, the more I pray, the more God wants to change me. And he does, right? He shapes me in the prayer. The more I pour out my heart, the more I faithfully go to him and I surrender, he changes me. And do you think that helps my situation with Linda? Heck yes, it does. Of course it does. Prayer changes you. And if you've got time in your quiet time, maybe you could pray for them. Maybe. Lie number two, a good marriage is always (laughs) 50-50. We had better laughs that time. Right? We know, we know when it's up there that it's, a, that it's a lie, but we believe it. And we act this way. When people say marriage is, and it's a hundred, a hundred. Yes. It's all, all, right? But when, we, when, when we're saying, hey, it's 50-50, you know what we're really saying? We're saying we're keeping track. We're saying it's 50-50 because it's like I'm keeping track of what I've done and I've invested in the relationship. And I'm also keeping track of what you've done and you've invested in the relationship. And I'm weighing them on the scales. And if I've done all of it in my own mind, then I get to wait here until you catch up. (laughs) It's what we say though. It's what we think. And then I'm going to wait for you to catch up. And then I'm waiting and you're waiting and we're both waiting and and love doesn't happen. It's a lie. Do you see how the enemy is lying to you and he's poisoning your relationship? The power of lies. Pastor Craig Rochelle had this cool quote. He said, half-hearted effort plus half-hearted commitment equals wholehearted disappointment. Mm-hmm. Yes. Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right. So gave himself up for her? What percentage is that? 100%. That's 100%. So when Jesus as our husband, see we're the, we're the spiritual bride to him. Jesus, as our husband, when he loves, he loves 100%, always. Lie number three, marriage shouldn't be this hard. Right? And this lie takes so many forms, doesn't it? This is like, I'm just not happy and God wants me to be happy. Our marriage is so much harder than their marriages are. We do this comparison thing and ours never seems to, to stack up. If it's this hard, it must be wrong. We must be wrong. I must have chosen the wrong person. And Disney promised me a soulmate and I didn't find him. (laughs) So I must need somebody else. And what we're really saying is if this marriage were meant to be, it would just work. Apple likes to say that about their electronic devices. They just work. And then they don't just work. It's anyway. We, We think our marriage ought to just work. And it ought to not be so much effort. And I'm not saying everything's supposed to be a struggle, right? Like here we are in church and like, you should be ready for suffering. It's not what I'm trying to say. But at the same time, how many of the things in your life that are currently broken will get better with you not working on them? If you've got a broken career, you got broken finances, you got a broken yard, how will they get if you just leave them? Right. Worse. Worse. We, we know it there. Why don't we know it in our relationship? Why do we judge our relationship? Because it takes effort. Gary Thomas said, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? It's a powerful statement. But he comes in and just looks at the scripture honestly and says, actually, there's, there's no declaration of independence in here. There's no moment where we have a right to happiness. We don't have a right to happiness. Ooh, I just messed with you, didn't I? God wants good things for us because he's a loving father. 
But sometimes the road that Jesus has us walk is a road with a cross on our backs. I didn't get any amens there. That's what your Bible says, though. And it's not that God doesn't want good things for you. It's just that I'm not trying to sell you anything today at all. He's got a path for you. And if you follow his path, his way, that might lead to happiness. If you stick with that spouse and, and you let God do what he wants with you, and he begins a process of holiness with you, you're like, well, how would that work? Well, what he's going to do is he's going to put you in situations where you're going to have to be selfless and love the other person. And it's like a brick wall sometimes. Where are the married people at? And you find all the things in you that are broken and you start to find and discover that you don't know anything about love. And if you enter into this relationship in Jesus' way, he's going to teach you how to love. But it's not going to be an easy process. And because it's not an easy process and because it's difficult and sometimes you're going to feel like you're a failure, even here in church, it's going to humble you. And you're going to be humble about, yeah, maybe our marriage isn't the best one in the room. Because maybe I'm embracing the reality of what's really going on. And it starts to humble you. And you start to chill as a person. And then guess what happens after humility? You start running to Jesus. Because you start to realize, I can't make them better. I can't fix this necessarily. I need a supernatural God to come in and rescue me. And do you see what you're starting to do? You're learning to love. You're being humbled. You're running to Jesus. If you follow the path of Jesus in your marriage, there's happiness here. I've seen it. But it's his way. Okay, next slide. Our marriage doesn't affect the kids. I appreciate those laughs. Right, because this is, this is the big Hollywood thing, right? Like we get the two stars and they put up the, the press release and the press release says, yeah, we've decided to call it quits. It's all going to be amicable, amicable and peaceful and we're going to be totally devoted to our kids. And what they're trying to imply to America is don't worry, the kids are going to be fine. And this is kind of what we all want to believe in some of these selfish decisions that we make, if we're real, is we want to believe that they're not affected Nobody else is going to be hurt. And and this, I'm not just picking on divorce here because that's a big part of it. But this is even for some of us who stay in our relationship and we're holding on to the commitment and the covenant, but we're not trying to actually love each other. We're committed to a lifetime of misery with a spouse. And we try to believe that that lack of friendship and lack of love doesn't impact the kids. Yes, it does. They see that. You're setting the tone for what a God-honoring marriage is supposed to look like. And some of you guys are out of balance even in the roles. And you're setting a tone to the kids for what marriage is supposed to look like. Exodus 20 verse 5 says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. God says this multiple times in the scripture. And sometimes we we make this kind of into this magic spiritual kind of a thing where it's like, well, there's sins that pass down through the generations magically and invisibly. It's very, very practical. If you sow sin and destruction into your family, your kids will reap that. Many of you are trying to build a marriage right now and you're trying to get past what your parents showed you. You know what I'm saying. Okay, next. There's no hope for my marriage. Woo! Lie number five. Got just one more after this. There's no hope for my marriage. This takes a lot of forms. Hmm. Um, I'm going to talk about my dad here for a second. Uh, if you've not heard me talk about him before, kind of a unique relationship that I had with him. The first part of his life, he was a very broken guy, did not follow Jesus. The second half of his life was very, very different. And he and I did a lot of healing together and we became very, very close. But I want to speak about something out of that first half. Because 
I remember being in my young, early 20s and Linda and I were not yet married and he confessed to me at one point that he had cheated on my mom and also confessed that he believed every man was destined to do the same thing. Now, I share something about a man that I dearly love because I actually saw him walk away from that lie himself. And I saw restoration and redemption come into his life. But I just tell, telling you about my experience that I lived in fear for quite a while that I would never be able to be faithful to Linda once we got married because somehow the things that the previous generations had done had destined me to walk in their footsteps. I used to have nightmares that I cheated on her. Is this real enough? We let people speak truths over us that are actually lies. And you need to get free of it today. Because God can bring hope where there is no hope. And you are not bound by what the generations before you have done. Uh, Jesus said this in Matthew 19. With, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Yeah. You might believe that your marriage is too broken today, that you've hurt each other too deep, deeply, been too cruel, crossed too many lines. We can't put this back together again. With God, all things are possible. And that right there is a choice to believe that that's true. Last one, last lie. God is annoyed that I don't have a perfect marriage. <laughs> it's the word annoyed that, that's, that's where the real punch of that statement is. You should be more put together by now. What is taking you so long? Your grandparents figured this out. What's your problem? Look down the row. Do you see how they're holding hands? Do you see how good they look? Do you see how nice their car is? What's your problem? And here we are at the end of a marriage series in a church. And this always happens whenever you do the marriage ceremonies, whenever you do the, the seminars, whenever you read the books, you can get to this place of real discouragement because you can get reminded of so many of the things you have not done. And some of those things can carry a weight to them. Not only of we missed our opportunity to do this thing early on and you can't go back and fix it. But the really punchy thing, God is disappointed in us. God is angry with us. We'll just let that sit out there in the room. Psalm 103 verse 15, 14. For God knows how weak we are, and he remembers that we are only dust. Amen. He chooses to remember our frame, one of your translations says, and he knows that we are only dust. That's the kindness of God today, and that's where we're going to park it for the rest of this. That's the kindness of God today. Can I get an amen? amen. The kindness of God, the kindness of God. God is kind. God understands us, not understands us to give us excuses, not grace so that we can sit, no, absolutely truthful with us, but died for every single part of our failure so that we could get up again because he's kind and you're broken today, but he's kind. It was never about you anyway. He's kind. That's why we worship him and we don't worship you. Amen? Amen. Our marriages are broken and he's not surprised. He knows we're dust. And that's a choice on his part to remember that. I love Jesus has this moment. I just love, I love God. If you're here just going to church and being religious and you don't love God yet, none of this is going to make sense to you. I love God. Because he's so kind to us. And without his kindness, none of this works. 
Jesus looked out at the crowds. Do you remember the moment he looks out at the crowds and he says, and he had compassion on them because they looked harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Do you remember when he did that? Because that's his way. Because when he looks at broken people, he feels compassion. That's his reaction. And Satan's in the background saying, nah, he's annoyed with you. Like that coach, like that parent, like that teacher, he's annoyed. He's telling you what God's tone is. That's not God's tone. That's not God's outlook on you. Jesus loves you. Amen. Jesus loves you. Six lies that wreck marriages. I have the summary slide up there real quick. Do you see what the enemy is doing to us? I can change him or her. Believe that. A good marriage is 50-50. It shouldn't be this hard. It doesn't affect the kids. There's no hope. God's annoyed that we're not fully there yet. Your perfection is a problem, or your imperfection is a problem for him. Not true. None of that's true. And it's all holding you back, poisoning the stew. So this last week, our family was out of town for a funeral. And there was a lot of emotion with that. And the death that we experienced in our family was sudden, extended family. And so we flew up to Chicago and And we were with everybody. And, and can I just tell you, in an impossible situation, and you guys have been in impossible situations, everybody did so great. Everybody's going out of their way to love each other, to try to say the right things. They're all trying to, you know, be generous and buy food. And one family member stayed up super late trying to put this photo book together for somebody else that really needed it. And all of these acts of kindness and beauty are going on all around us, but also a ton of brokenness because situations like this are just kind of uniquely impossible to get through. And we somehow get through them, but it's almost like somebody sat down and tried to design something impossible that you couldn't squirm your way out of. And you've been in crises like that before. All the grief and loss, and pain, all of the sudden. Family brokenness that all of a sudden comes to the surface and kind of wounds, old wounds that get reopened just a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Miscommunication that happens a bit. Expectations, just in my family, probably. Your family doesn't have weird expectations at all, probably. <laughs> Assumptions that people make. And they're all trying their hardest, but all this stuff kind of squeaks out. And it starts to weigh on you. And it's not just that stuff that weighs on you. Some of you are feeling financial press in the mid, financial pressure and stress in the middle of that funeral because of all the funeral expenses. Some of you guys have been through funerals and you, you paid the debt on that for 10 years after. And then there's travel expenses that come in. And then there's all the food that you eat, all the bad food that you eat. It's really tasty, but when you're an old guy, it kind of messes with you and... That's no fun. And then you're sleeping in a bed that you're not used to and you don't have your favorite pillow with you because you left that at home. I, I, I've thought about naming my pillow. I love my pillow so much. So if you have any name ideas, I'd love to hear them. Precious? Precious. <laughs> Fluffy, maybe. Um, no pillow. And, you know, and there's things that you've forgotten. You're living out of a suitcase and all of this while all the emotional stuff is also happening and you're not sleeping well and you're sore and you're grumpy and you're going through TSA and flights. Oh, and there's no leg room, right? I don't know what they've done to us, but America just keeps putting up with it. We just go. And it's like, you know, and you, yeah, yeah. And I remember just going through that experience. And again, just people were awesome. And they'd have every right to kind of stop you and say, you know, don't be impatient with me. I just lost somebody I love. Can't you back off and just understand? And we all have a right to say that to each other, do we not? But we try to hold it back. And we just, but man, it's the fall. Do you realize we live in a cursed world? And these things are hard. And there was this man who was sitting in the seat in front of me on the way back. We were on the flight back from Chicago. And 
<laughs> there was this wrestling team that had come and there was this guy who was just huge, just huge guy, probably seven foot tall, like Andre the Giant, you know what I mean? And, and he's, he gets a window seat. They shove him into a window seat, like right in front of me. And you're like, how do you even fit in there, you know? And he's just like a human pretzel sitting in that seat with no leg room and can't move around, you know, and the thing comes down above him and all this kind of stuff. And partway through the flight, I, I just see the seat moving around like this and I look up and Andre the Giant is in there and he he's, has a hoodie on and he decides he's too warm and he wants to take it off. So across like 30 minutes, he's trying to peel this thing <laughs> off of him without elbowing the... <laughs> And you're watching this whole thing take place and you're like, it's like somebody with a great sense of humor designed this situation right here. <laughs> Tied up like a pretzel. And I looked at him and I had this moment with God and I'm like, this is a picture of our entire week. And all the layers the sleep and the food and the finances and the, the emotions and the old hurts and all of this stuff all tr try and come together. And we're all trying to squeeze ourselves through it. And it's all impossible. Do you see how impossible it is? And in the midst of all that impossibility, you're trying to have a marriage. And you're trying not to hurt each other. And you're trying not to lose your temper and let things out. Because man, if you just let it all go, you'd be cruel, wouldn't you? You have those spiritual defenses up and you try to hold things back. But sometimes there's been these situations and you've gone through these crises and stuff squeaks out. And what do you do then? God is not annoyed with you. Amen. God is ready to forgive you. Amen. God, God sees you. He looked out on them and he saw people who he had compassion on because they were like sheep without a shepherd. It all reminded me of this old hymn called Come Ye Sinners. I've got it up on the screen for you. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus, he's ready, he stands to save you. Full of pity, love and power. This is written in 1750, by the way. Come ye weary, heavy laden, bruised and broken by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, if you wait till you're better, you will never come at all. I just, I just love how this hymn just cuts right to the quick. Yeah. It's about you coming to Jesus. And you're like, oh man, that sounds like religion. That sounds like Christianity. That sounds like this over-spiritualizing all my practical pain. It's not. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He knows your dust. Come to Jesus. He knows you're in a, tied up in a pretzel in this relationship that you're in and that none of it makes sense and none of it works and he's not surprised. And he died for you. He died for every husband and every wife and every marriage in this room. He died because he loves you. Do you love our kind God today? This man in 1750, he knew the kindness of his God. Joseph Hart. I'm such a theology nerd, I had to look up who Joseph Hart was. And there was actually this intro that he wrote to the hymn book in, in the 1700s. And in this intro, like five of you in the room care about this, but I'll just tell you anyway. <laughs> but in the intro, this guy is so raw about his story and what a sinner he was, what a rebel he was. And, and he was this pastor and he was all intellectual, kind of this kind of 1700s Pharisee guy. And he wasn't following Jesus at all. Even though he intellectually, he had the job and stuff, but he didn't actually know Jesus. And he said this, he said, in this uneasy, restless round of sinning and repenting, working and dreading, I went on for about seven years when a great domestic affliction befalling me. Do you know what great domestic affliction is? That's a marriage fight. So next time you fight in the van on the way to church, say, we had a great domestic affliction. <laughs> he says, in which I was a moderate sufferer, but a monstrous sinner. I began to sink deeper and deeper into conviction of my own nature's evil. He's saying, I started to face myself. Why? Because that's what God wants marriage to be. 
where you face yourself, where you start to humble, you start to surrender, you start to learn to love. And this guy in the 1700s didn't even know Jesus, not for real, until he got married. And that's for real how it happened. He got married and experienced difficulty in his marriage because he was facing himself. And this hymn came out of it. Is that crazy? You're like, not if you saw my marriage, you wouldn't think it's crazy. Titus 3, 4 through 5, which is not on your screen, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. God is kind toward your wounded marriage today. God is kind toward your wounded marriage today. God is kind toward your wounded marriage today. Not surprised. Why don't you guys stand? We'll pray together. If you're sitting here and you're like, you know, we're at the end of this marriage series and you say, come ye sinners to Jesus, kind of feels like a letdown. I'm not sure that's so practical. Let me just tell you, you have never been more wrong. Anytime, let, let me just, let me give you the mathematical formula of how Linda and I fight for a second. When we fight, there's pain and there's destruction. And when I finally wake up to the amount of pain and destruction I'm causing, you know what I try to do next? I try to fix it. And then I go through this period of time of trying to fix us. And that never works, by the way. And finally, this moment happens. It's like the lights turn on in the room. I'm like, I haven't prayed yet. I'm not praying. I'm not going before the throne and begging God, fix my marriage. This is it. To surrender. And, and as, soon as, as soon as I get to that place, I finally say, God, you got to fix us. As soon as I get there, the battle's won. I mean, we may, we may watch for it to unfold, the blessing to come, but it's like the battle's won there because I'm surrendered finally. So when I say come to Jesus, he knows how broken you are. It's the whole thing. It's the whole series. Come to Jesus. So we're going to have a song now. and the, the worship band has kindly learned this Come Ye Sinners song for us and they're going to sing it to you and you might just want to let them sing it over you. You might want to use this time to pray and to start to come to Jesus yourself. Don't leave this room without it. Amen. I mean that. Some of you, God's got a hold of your heart right now and he's asking you to surrender this thing to him. And you need to do it before you leave. So take this time during the song. I'm going to open up the altar even. We don't do this a lot, but I'm going to open up the altar. And I don't have weird pastor expectations on you that people are going to come up here or that you have to come up here. I'm not going to be pushy with you at all. But some of you, you're in such a place right now and the Holy Spirit is on you so powerfully and so strong, and you know you need to cross some spiritual line that is massive where you surrender your marriage, you may want to come up here, maybe kneel, maybe stand, whatever it is, and just pray that to God. Cross a line. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this is a time of ministry. Lord Jesus, this is a time, God, where we surrender things to you, God, that we haven't surrendered before. Or God, maybe we've tried before, God, but it doesn't feel like it's worked. Maybe our heart wasn't fully in it. I don't know. But Lord, I pray for power in this room. I pray for a quickening. I pray, Lord God, that you would drive those that you want to drive to decision. I pray that we would surrender Stop trying to fix things ourselves. Come, Lord. Miracles all over this room, Lord. Come in Christ's name.